This is part two of the heart of Nehemiah. There are many different seasons, but it's important to understand the season that we're in as well as doing the groundwork for a clear vision. And once you get started building, realize there's gonna be always someone who has a spirit of ridicule trying to get you to stop. Don't ever stop. And Nehemiah shows us exactly how to deal with it. Take a look. Be sure to subscribe and press alert to get new notifications of new success secrets made available on VFN TV. We've been talking about the heart of Nehemiah, the heart of Nehemiah, because it really is the sum total of repentance. When we begin to look at the condition and um, if you missed our earlier segments, you need to get them because we're just having a conversation, you know, just God help us understand uh, what you were saying through Nehemiah, the one who, who had your heart, who who had your perspective. And there's so many things that we'll be discussing in this conversation. And uh, you can catch up on the VFN torch by going to vfntv.com and click on the torch, but it just describes our present state. And there's one thing about um, when you read Nehemiah and don't think you're reading a book, you're reading Nehemiah's perspective. He's, he's talking about what happened and he was such an owner of his reality he was such a an aware of God's control and God's that he is God of the universe and that he does establish all authority and no authority exists outside of what he establishes and those who rebel against rebel against what God's established. He was so aware that everything was created by God and for God and has its existence and God was over it. He was so aware that everything God does, he does out of love. And even if it's tough, he knows it's right because of the condition. And if it's if we're going through some difficult times and some bad times, it's because there's something that we must have done wrong. We must have turned our backs on him. We've, we've done mm. this stuff. And then, so then he looked around and observed and he realized, yeah, that's what we've done. You know, we've done all this. And we'll be talking more about that. But just hang on and understand this process of that because because what he said was, I mean, and specifically, and nine is just something you want. If you're you're going to be involved in, in a, a time of fasting and prayer in the beginning of this year. And believe me, I encourage you to do that. You know, position yourself to hear from God. I know a lot of people in the city of Pensacola are in prayer for Pensacola, headed up by Joe Miller. And um, I think you can get to it at prayerforpensacola.org, I guess. Uh, you probably get to it on our um, site as well. Go to links, vfntv.com and links. Uh, but others are praying and fasting as well, understanding that, that um, you know, I encourage you to meditate on the word of God, but meditate on Nehemiah mm. and um, you know what it takes to really get God's attention because the things that changed, the things that changed in California was a man named Seymour who got God's attention. The things that changed in Northeastern United States was a man named John G. Lake who got God's attention. The things that changed in Pensacola, Florida in 1995 was a man named Steve Hill who got God's attention, a man named uh, John Kilpatrick who got God's attention. I mean, this is it. I mean, you know, men, you can get God's attention, but Nehemiah, we're seeing here how you can get God's attention because I mean, there was nothing any different from the day before than it was that day for the accept exception as he knew how to approach a holy God. He knew, he knew about sin. He knew about God's perspective and feelings towards sin. And he knew that, that the only way out of this is the original intent, God's way, and to get back to that some way. And he couldn't get out of it by blaming others, and he couldn't get out of it by blaming God, and he couldn't be offended with God and all these different things people say you need to do. He had to take ownership. He had to take ownership, and he took such deep ownership and then, by the way, when you start gathering folks around you for to walk out the heart of Nehemiah, if they don't take ownership of their stuff, they can't be a part of it because mm. they're walking into an area of where they're trying to lasso every other person and every other circumstance to blame everybody but take ownership for themselves. Mm. And there's nothing that produces humility like, you know, you know, realizing that outside of him, I am them. I've done this. This is me, God. Help me, Lord. And uh, forgive me for my sin and their sin, not just theirs. Don't forget their right. sin. <laughs> and um, and so in the context of that, when you start hearing this trumpet call that we'll talk about and coming to the wall, and we're going to talk about the the trumpet, we're going to talk about the torch, the sword, we're going to talk about the 
you know, the building with the trial. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, some things the Lord has shown us that way and also about uh, being watchmen on the wall and hearing the warning. And, and this is all, this is what God's doing. And so hearing this and getting clarity in this conversation, I think it's going to stir your heart. God's going to speak to you. But soak on, just soak on, I mean, believe, believe me, you know, Nehemiah uh, 1 and um, and 9 is, is good enough to really just soak mm. on those too, because 9 carries you all the way from the time of uh, Israel's, you know, rebellion, you know, through all this whole journey to how they got to where they are and how over and over again, you know, God's people will turn their back on God, even though they're living in the land. They're living in the, but he's, he's saying things like, you know, you know, here, you know, we're living in the land that you blessed us with, this fertile land, this, 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 this spacious land, which all I think of spacious guys, you know, mm. the, the, the mm. song, yeah. you know, spacious guy, this fertile land. I think about, you know, America used to be the breadbasket of the world. And he said, even while there were, and he says the Kings, the leaders, the priests and the fathers, Wow, but you covered everybody. You can't just blame some, some political leader here in America. You can't just blame uh, the, the, the ministers, you can't just blame, um, the other leaders and the businesses and all that. You got to blame the fathers too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The whole kit caboodle. And he said, even while they're walking in this, uh, this spacious, fertile blessing that you gave them, they did not listen to you. They didn't follow your commands and they didn't turn from their evil. Mm. I mean, he was just said he was getting, he was li- literally drawing a perspective out that he could, he could tell God, I really, I do understand this, God. I do understand this. You were wanting and have been faithful and merciful. And even while they were walking in this spacious, fertile land and this blessing that you've given them, that you still were extending your mercy while they weren't listening to you and they were killing the prophets and they're doing all this kind of stuff, you know? And they're just, mm-hmm. and you just, and for the very fact that suddenly one day you said, okay, my servant Nebuchadnezzar is going to take over for a season because you don't listen. It's because we deserved it. It's not because all of us, because you're a mean guy. It's because you're a loving God. You tried every way to get our attention, but we wouldn't listen to you. Mm. We wouldn't listen to you. Even in this vast, spacious, fertile nation, wouldn't even listen to you. Not the, not the kings, not the priests, not the leaders, and not the fathers. And so it was all across the board. And so we look at that and think, oh my goodness, we really got to get the heart of Nehemiah here. And and I think just by talking about it, it's helping me. I don't know if it's helping you. It's, it's encouraging. Yeah, it's yeah. very good. Yeah. And we're going to make the whole thing available to you at, in the, uh, at VFNTV.com as well. But we're just talking about um, in our last segment about this, that, you know, Nehemiah went through this whole journey and process, you know, of brokenness, acknowledgement. Um, he was a good employee. He, he worked for his employer, just happened to be the king. And um, that he, he always came with a good attitude. He had a good attitude and everything was right. And uh, suddenly when something was truly wrong, he could not control himself because his heart was so broken and the king recognized it, even defined it and discerned it and said, this must be a matter of the heart. And he says, you know, what's going on? And he tells him, he says, you know, should I not be, you know, devastated over the fact that, you know, my people's uh, burial place, that the land of my people is laid in ruin, that the gates are burned and the walls are broken down. And that's where we kind of left off in the context of that. And so, and so the, the king's heart was, was favorable towards, towards Nehemiah when he was, he was talking to him. And this is so important because we begin to talk about this and we kind of broke in on the, on the, and had to break off in the last moment. But um, he asks him something. If you can't answer questions about your plan, hmm. If you can't, if somebody can't, if, if they ask you 20 questions and you can't answer any of them or only answer two of them, you're not ready yet. Or maybe you are an answer to that one or two that you can't answer and you got to get with somebody who God has given the vision to, who's given the battle plan yeah, to, and then you're going to maybe, maybe you're like anointed for that answer, that part of the answer. Hmm. And when you put 20 of those guys together, they can answer all 20 questions. And then we work together as, I don't know, 700 ministers ministering to 250,000 <laughs> folks at the same time and beginning to be a light again to the nations. You never know. You just never know what God's going to do. Uh, but if you only have a few answers, you need to get with a, a gathering of a team that God's putting together in a family that, that you can all come together and hear clearly what, you know, what God is saying. But he had to have the answers. 
I mean, he didn't have a counsel in the context of what he was talking about. He didn't tell anybody what was even going on, what was in his heart. It was between him and God and just a brief explanation to the king. And the king says, specifically, this is the question he asked him. He says, well, you know, how much time do you need? And what is it you want? And he says, you know, I want to be able to go back and, and re, specifically rebuild these walls and these gates again. And so while he's sitting with the queen in verse 6, that's Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 6, he says, well, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? <laughs> hmm. Well, you know, I'm just kind of following the spirit and, um, right. you know, I'm just kind of working my way to the next entrapment and deception and captivity. <laughs> what are you doing? That's not how God is. God is direct. God speaks. God, I mean, you think the troubles happen and persecution happens, but if you're ignorant and you're walking out saying that, you know, you're walking out in faith, you know, ignorance is not faith. Mm -mm. You know, understanding, it's just foolishness. I mean, even the word of God says that a, that a prudent man sees danger and prepares for it, but a fool keeps going and suffers for it. If you, if you don't even know there's danger, if you don't even understand, they'll kill you and think they're doing God a favor. If you don't understand, and, and some of my naivety in the past was, you know, people who um, claim to be messengers of God, that you would just sit there and watch with just tears coming in your eye. And you're thinking, you know, what do you do with this, this, this person who professes to be a leader of God's folks that's killing you? Mm. It's killing mm. a move of God, right? I mean, yeah. what do you, what do you do with that? I mean, what do you do with it? I mean, Jesus had that, but it's just so unreal. You know, the ones you love and yeah. the ones you want things to work out and, you know, and you're just like, you know, well, you know why would this, you know, and you think about it, but this happens. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a plan, Sam Ballot's got one for you. And we'll talk more about that. We'll be right back. Don't miss your chance to get this free book, I Will Fight 10 Strategies for Your Success, where I share a prophetic encounter God gave me about a coming wealth transfer. And this whole genesis of this book and these strategies is to position you for a coming wealth transfer. It's 10 strategies for success, dealing with your belief, your actions, commitments, giving you plans, giving you strategies. I mean, so many things I can't even talk about, but it's yours for free. Go to vfnkb.com and get your free copy now. And, and so you have to know, and then and the driving factor is love, you know, love of God and love for God's people and love for God's ways. And we get back from this break, we're going to talk about, you know, he answered that question very specifically, and we have to be ready. You got to pray. Dear God, you said that people without a vision will perish. Or you said that there's a purpose to writing down a vision and making it plain and making it clear so everybody can run with it. He had to have such clarity of vision that these builders and workers and fellow brothers Men of God, women of God had to come and be able to work in the context of the vision that he had to rebuild God's people, the walls and the gates. And you, dear God, give us the heart of Nehemiah. I mean, you are really speaking to us through this. And I want to encourage you if you're going to be involved in a lot of people, are, a lot of the believers are fasting across the nation. And this is going to be a year. This is going to be a year. We need to hear the voice of the Lord. I encourage you. If we don't understand the sum total of repentance, if we don't understand the heart of, of Nehemiah here, I don't believe we're going to be able to, to bring the authority back, the gates back into the church again, and the walls and the safety back in there again. Um, I mean, she will in the world, but not necessarily mm -hmm. in America. But I think we will. I, mean, I feel very hopeful about why we're doing this, but we need to hear this. Yeah. They don't, there are no assumptions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so here's Nehemiah before the king, uh, and finally he just says, you know, what do you want? And he says, I want to rebuild it. I want to rebuild it with these burnt stones. And you think about it. When you're hearing this, understand Jesus is mentioned throughout the entire Old Testament. I mean, it's over and over again. It's a depiction of our Savior that's coming. And he tells us that we are a temple, temple of God, not built by human hands, and that we are living stones. And that he's going to build us out of burnt stones. Mm. And when you're looking at Nehemiah come back, begin to see this is, this, is, this is a depiction of Jesus. This is what he wants. He wants us. We're not talking about going and building a stucco building or a crystal cathedral building or a house or a coffee shop. We're talking about people. When the people are right, the dwelling will be right. It doesn't matter what the dwelling is. And he says that, that he's going to rebuild 
He's going to rebuild. That's what he wants to do is rebuild it. And so the king says, while he's sitting beside the queen, he says, listen, how long will your journey take? How long is it going to take? And when are you going to get it back? I mean, if you can't answer that question, you're not ready yet. Yeah. And so you got to be able to spend some time soaking. And listen, like I said, if you have one or two of the answers, maybe you need to be with, with the whole group of gathering that is hearing clearly so all of you can hear together. Like the five-fold ministry, if you will. I mean, just the whole a team. Some things that are happened that we... Um, had a chance, John read over the air, the Apple prophecy, the blossoming of in, in 2014. You want to hear it because it's going to take teams to be able to bring this to pass. He talks about this is going to be such a powerful move of God to be able to rebuild people, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so he says, you know, um, okay. So the, he says, if it pleases the king to send me, um, I'll set a time. Think about that. Mm-hmm. How many people would trust the president? How many Christians would trust the president or the congressman or a senator or a governor or your local authority? This is Nehemiah understanding everything that he understood. He had the right paradigm. If you missed the earlier part, he had the right paradigm. He understood that many are the plans in a man's heart, but God's plans are going to prevail. If my heart is right towards God, then leadership's heart is going to be right towards me. Mm. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And whatever that means. I mean, where the Elijah and, and Ahab, you know, the king's heart was right towards him. He didn't want to hear anything mm-hmm. God had to say. So Elijah was doing what he, you know, that's how it's going to happen. So he said, oh, if it please, he still threw it back into the, he didn't take it and run with it. He threw it back into the king's hand again. He said, well, if it's, if it pleases the king to be able to send me, I'll set a time. Mm. I will set a time. You're talking about humility. You're talking about humility. My like, dear Lord, help us. Help us understand uh, what um, you've established and how in control you are. Help us to be with the right mindset, your mindset, Jesus, when you said, no, no, Pontius Pilate. Mm. The only authority you have is what's given you from above. No, Herod, soon to be eaten by worms. Mm. No, Nebuchadnezzar, taking credit for what I did. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's just like, no, no, don't you understand? I'm in control here. I'm not far from you. I've done all this to see if you'd reach out and acknowledge what Nehemiah is acknowledging here. This is what he says. He says in Acts chapter 17, he says, God doesn't live in a temple built by human hands as if he needed anyone. He's chose the very exact times and seasons and the the place that you would live. He did all this for one reason, to see if you would reach out and touch him, though he's not far from you. Nehemiah Hmm. knew where God was. He knew that God had designed all this. And guess what? Nehemiah reached out and touched God. He reached out and touched God, and he go, my goodness. And all of this Babylonian captivity, there's a man. And all of a sudden, he's a man, right? I love mm-hmm. for a man to stand in the right. gap so I wouldn't right. have to destroy the land. And here's this man saying, and he began to feel the, inf- the, the not infirm, but feel the brokenness of God, the pain of God, the, the, the lover of mankind. Felt his, he, felt, he felt his pain. All this love and this spacious land and fertile land and blessed and, and, and the rejection that God has had felt over and over again and just sent messenger after messenger saying, Hey, turn back, turn back. Hey, turn back. Turn back. I just want to keep you in this blessing. I'm going to keep you in this blessing. And didn't he sort of fill in that pain? I mean, like Samuel got a little mixed up on that when, um, he went and talked to the people and the people said, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. And so Samuel's crying in his tent, you know, in his house, his tent, and uh, God's going, you're a messenger. <laughs> you are just a messenger. They're rejecting me, Samuel. They're not rejecting you. When all those messengers were rejected, they were rejecting God who, who loves them and loves us. And there are so many, there's, there's some weird things going on out there where people are hearing like a little bit and they're running with it, the rest in their flesh. But they listen to the commonality of what's being said. Don't just throw it out. Realize if they're, if they're right. I mean, even this King, uh, you know, you think about Nebuchadnezzar, he heard clearly, he just didn't understand it. So don't just throw anything out. If, if an unsafe King can hear, if a Pharaoh can hear, have a dream That's about right. the direction of God, don't be chunking everybody out. Because if you have a believer who's missing it somewhat, listen to what they're saying, because you know, 5% of that can be right. <laughs> or 80% can be right. I don't know. We know in part and prophesy in part. But don't just say, you know, they're weird, so I'm not going to be able to listen to them. And so he says, okay, I'll set a time. And this is what he said. Now, he's turning it back on the king again. And he says, okay, I'll set a time for it to do it. He says, well, if it pleases the king, he says again, 
may I have letters? Which back then, I mean that that was that was you know the seal of the king. Yeah, right. I mean Jezebel knew this. All I need is the seal and a letter, <laughs> and I could run this puppy, That's right? right? Mm-hmm. Almost like today, got a pen, a pen, oh, yeah. a phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. He says so. Uh, if it pleases the king, may I have some letters, letters, plural, uh, to the governor of Trans Euphrates, so that they will provide safe uh, conduct until I arrive there. In other words, I need some, I need some authority from you. To make sure those who are under you mm. won't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you the cupbearer to the king? What are you all here doing? You know? And then, and that's one letter. Another one, he says, I, you know, that I may have, have a letter to ask of the keep, keeper of the royal forest so that I can get some timbers to be able to build the beams of the citadel and the temple and the, and the, the residents and all that occupy that particular area. And he's going, listen, there's a royal forest out there. And I understand that it is, is it's government owned, but um, we need a faith based grant right here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's asking the king to take the tax dollar and to um, the of the of the uh, national forests mm-hmm. in America, if you would, the national forests in that area, and saying, "Listen, I need a letter that says I can take as much lumber as I need to be able to build." What's in my vision? Mm-hmm. This is not powerful. Beautiful. This is so powerful. And we're going to be coming to an end of this one and picking it back up and continue this conversation in a minute. We're talking about God, give us the heart of Nehemiah. And so then he says well, this way, if I have these letters, you know, he says, uh, I can actually get through all the stuff, get the lumber and get what I need. And he says, this is what he says. He says, because the gracious hand of my Lord was on me, the King granted all my requests. You see, he did not give the king any glory, even though he honored him as king and respected him as king and honored him as his employer and did what was right before him, even with his continence and his attitude. But he always credited God. Mm. God did it through this king, gave him all those letters because he understood Romans 13, 1 through 5, all authorities established by God. They're his servants to do you good. About him. But right now, we got to get the heart of Nehemiah. We have to really... And so we're going to continue this conversation today about the heart of Nehemiah. If you have your Bibles, you can follow us. But we're just having a conversation. You know, we're in chapter 2, just talking about it. And it needs to be applicable to our now. It needs to fit our now. And this doesn't need to be a historical document. This needs to be, this is us. And uh, um, we can learn so much. And I want to encourage you that if you're spending a time... Uh, in fasting and prayer or anything of that nature, you know, soak on Nehemiah chapter one and Nehemiah uh, chapter 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 nine to really soak and say, you know, dear God, help me understand the right perspective. Give me mm-hmm. your perspective. You know, the sum total of repentance. What does it look like? Uh, because uh, the you know, as one of the leaders in the uh, Baptist Church said in America, he said that the uh, church has been. Um, selling people on America and just giving them Jesus. Wow. And he said this dilemma is good mm-hmm. because what's happening right now, because it's causing people to realize, you know, we need to separate ourselves from a nation in the context of we're in it, but we're not of it. But we need to tell the truth about Jesus. Mm. You know, we need, we need to preach, pe- preach Jesus. And he was talking about how good, because it kind of breaks up that, that integration, um, um, the flag being wrapped around the, the cross mm. and instead of the, the, the flag being submitted to the cross, it was going to be that way as a nation, but we are a nation. We're a royal priesthood. So we're not looking for some, some land base somewhere, some papal seat or something. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so, <laughs> but uh, we're talking about that. And so Nehemiah, if you heard in the earlier segments of already, he's already seen the condition of things. He was, he, he, he sought the Lord. He prayed, he fasted, he was broken. And you got to hear all these segments because it's just going to bless your heart. To say, oh, I can see now there is an actual practical way to approach a spiritual God. There is a practical way to be able to honor God and what he's established to be able to do this. And so here he is. He he appeared before the king who was his employer. And um, the king, because of how he handled himself and the character he had, long story short, the king's like, you know, what do you want? Mm. What do you want? And he said, well, I need this, this, and this. And the king granted it to him. And gave him authority to be able to do it, you know. And so mm-hmm. here we are in 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 uh, verse ten, which is very important. We're going to talk a little bit about it ten, but he'll come up again. We'll talk about him again. But there's this man called Sanballat. Uh, he was a Hornite. We'll just call him a whore for short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a Hornite, 
and Tebite, and uh, he was an official who heard about what was going on. And so here you have, uh, understand, you might want to keep it a secret. It's it's kind of really full. I mean, this is this is the thing that you got to realize that it it may be quiet for a period of time and enjoy that time and get as much done as you can mm-hmm. during that time. But no, no, as long as there's human beings, you know, before telephone, there was tele telechristian and they go, they say, don't tell anybody. I can only tell you. And 15 of those encounters later, it's around the nation. So I mean, realize it's going to be, you know, it's going to be out and it's not a big deal anyway. I mean, it doesn't matter, but there's a tiny there's a little small window of opportunity you have for that to be able to happen. But here he is. He's talking to the king. He's had this relationship with the king for quite some time. And Sandbal is already knowing what's going on. You know why? Because mm-hmm. he's got folks there. He's got folks there. He thinks he's in real tight with the king. And he will, as a matter of fact, he'll hear about later on, he'll begin to talk about, um, um, you know, what he's going to do. He's going to go approach the king and, and tell him some stuff that's not true and try to stop what was going on. So uh, don't be intimidated by, by that. And remember, he said, because of the hand of the Lord was on me, I prayed to the Lord and he, he led me. King said to me, I paused and I prayed and I said, so he's in tune with God. He's not, he's, he's got the vertical going on and he's honoring the horizontal why it's happening right there. But God is the one that's leading Nehemiah in the context of this. Well, a horizontal happening is happening here with Sambal in verse 10. Cause when Sambal heard about it, he says that they were very much disturbed. Mm. And let me tell you something. Those that are held captive by, uh, the, the, um, who are held captive. I'm sort of like Rick Joyner's vision that he had called the call when you know people who love God who are in captivity and there's people who don't even know God at all who are in captivity the captivity's captivity held captive mm-hmm. to do Lucifer's will and this is what sandball is doing so you don't think you're not going to have a sandball it don't be mm-hmm. a sandball it you know repent you know mm-hmm. I mean what a terrible thing what a terrible thing you think about it you know, it's like, do you really want that on your resume when you're standing before the throne of God, even if you repent, you know? And so uh, they were very much disturbed, he says, that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Jews, mm-hmm. of the Israelites. Do you think what's happening today in the nation and the world is, is unique? I mean, they were upset that somebody was going to go over there and help out the Jews. Mm-hmm. Think about that. What's the problem with that? I mean, you've got burnt, burnt gates, broken down walls. We're actually in bondage. We're in captivity. What can right. we do to you? <laughs> exactly. What can we do to you? But all of a sudden, Sam Ballot and his crew, uh, whore for short, the um, whore night, that uh, it's like, my goodness. When you look at that today, you start looking and thinking, my good, a spirit of Sam Ballot is on our leadership towards Israel today. Because hmm. Israel just said the other day, they just said, you know, uh, why don't you leave us in peace? And now America has a sandballot spirit on it saying, we demand an apology from you. It's like, yeah, but you're actually disturbed. You're, you're stirring up disturbance over here and you're going to get us hurt. Just we want to be peaceful. Mm-hmm. So just like what was happening back then, that same spirit and what it is, is the antichrist spirit, anti, you know, don't, don't love Jews and don't love Christians. JJ, yeah. if you haven't heard JJ, you need to hear JJ. doesn't matter how good it's going. You've got to always ask the question, what about JJ? Mm-hmm. And now I'm not talking about good times here. We're talking about bad times. We'll be right back. Don't miss your chance to get this free book, I Will Fight 10 Strategies for Your Success, where I share a prophetic encounter God gave me about a coming wealth transfer. And this whole genesis of this book and these strategies is to position you for a coming wealth transfer. It's 10 strategies for success. Dealing with your belief, your actions, commitments, giving you plans, giving you strategies. I mean, so many things I can't even talk about. But it's yours for free. Go to vfnkb.com and get your free copy now. Welcome back to VFN TV with your host, Craig Lancaster. And so uh, with that, um, they were just disturbed that anything good was going to happen or they were going to rise again. So on this journey of restoration, on this journey of getting Nehemiah's heart, understand there's people right now they think everything's totally fine. They have no problem with the bondage, the captivity, the darkness, the sin, the broken authority. They're happy with the horizontal um, networking that they've established to be able to do what they want to do in the context of what's going on. It doesn't disturb them that the church is in bondage. It doesn't disturb them that 
that false doctrines are being preached. It doesn't disturb them. They're okay with that, mm-hmm. which means when you start to move forward in redemption and move forward into the hordes of hell to try to rebuild people and rebuild the walls and the authority that there's going to be people with a Sam ballot spirit mm. that because you're disturbing them, you're, they're disturbed over the fact you're going to mess up my political sphere that I got going on. Don't you realize I bring all the politicians here and I, you know, I was like, Oh my goodness, you know, and all that kind of thing. And so, um, they're just going to be disturbed. Nothing you can do about that. There's mm. nothing you can do about that. But remember, never forget that it's not a. It's it's that they themselves can be set free if they'll fo- if they'll follow God. If they'll follow the one that you're following, so they can be set free. And uh, quite often, the ones that's going to help you are the ones that are hurting you today. Mm-hmm. You know, remember we talked about that in the torch and the sword, and we've seen it. And and so here, realize this sand ballot spirit will come up. As a matter of fact, I have a teaching. It's called rebuilding the walls. The spirit of Nehemiah versus the spirit of Sanballat. And you got to really hear that. You got to hear it because uh, it's going to encourage you because nobody wants to, so many people think about, they go, they say, hey, you know, yeah, I want to be in ministry. Oh, Ooh. do you? That's just <laughs> wonderful. I'm really? very excited for you. Yeah. Um, God gives a man a vision. Hmm. destroys the man then brings forth the vision right, right? Mm-hmm. so if it's if it's a call of god on your life i mean that means god's wanting to do something here mm-hmm. and god was wanting israel to repent this wasn't a nehemiah project this was god responding to nehemiah's heart and so um that's wonderful by the way you know get in but in that that the first little conflict the first little battle the first little difficulty and there's so many things that will just shock you it's just amazing you know, and, um, and that you got to continue on. You got to be faithful. Yeah. You got to stick, stay and stand even mm-hmm. when it stinks, because understanding that God, you didn't call you, God called you and he That's knows right. what's going on and he knew what you were when he called you. And so don't think, Oh, you know, you're just being revealed to yourself. Pretty bad, huh? <laughs> 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 we knew it already. You're just finding out it's okay. God still loves you. And so in the context of that, that, that don't, I mean, you're gonna have to, it's going to take some bull-nosed, hard-headed tenacity because you're going to have people come against you. And if you don't have clarity of vision that we talked about and you don't have a definite call and you're not rightly related to a body of believers who truly are kingdom-minded and not just, you know, my, my art or whatever, but you're kingdom-focused who understand it's going to be forceful and forceful men lay hold of it, then it's going to be real tough to survive that. You know, there is no Lone Rangers in regards to that kind of thing. You're going to have to, if you're going to do it, you'll, I mean, it'll be exciting. It'll be the most beautiful shooting star that anybody's ever seen. And then you'll spend the rest of your uh, life in therapy wondering if you're okay with God because you left your call. Hmm. You know, that's if you could, you know, because hmm. you got so wounded, so mm-hmm. hurt, or you did something so wrong that they wouldn't even, you know, it just, it just rejects you. Or you can listen to wisdom. You can listen to wisdom. The greatest privilege that we have as um the church is to be in the family of god not somebody just saying hey we're family you know haven't you seen the memo in your mailbox i'm at being family <laughs> because you just you know our leaders just got together recently and and just being together was the most beautiful thing i was just i was as we were together i was thinking about jesus and his disciples and how they were just so close and there's so much love and compassion and well, actually, there was probably more love and compassion than there was the disciples in regards to it. was just so cool mm-hmm. to see. I mean, and it was just, was it not beautiful? Yeah, yeah. it really was. And that's awesome. your, by the way, that's your reward. So you work from that place of wholeness of being rightly related to the family. And listen, if somebody says it's family, it's not family, you help them become family, you know, through maybe um, fundamentally transforming them through abiding, which we talk about, or find the family of God that God's called you to. And that's where you go. That's where you relate. And that's where you stay. And you function in the context of that. So here he goes. Nehemiah goes out. And I'm going to tell you what he does when he first gets there. Because now he's got out. He has the authority. He makes it through all these difficult places. Uh, he's not intimidated that there's a, some sort of plot going on by Sam Ballot. How horrific. How blind can you be? Hmm. How blind can you be to be used like Judas? I mean, hmm. Think about it. How blind? I mean, think about this. Think about this before you make your next strategy or you have your next conversation or you gossip one more time or you say something that brings division amongst the brethren, mm. trying to divide people from, from
from what God is doing in a city, in a country, in a nation. Think about this. Do you really want that plaque over your head? Do you really want to be known as one that stirred up derision and division in the body? Mm -hmm. Think about that. Is that what you really want to be known for? Because if you do that, that's what you're going to be known for. You're going to have to answer for that. And it's such a prideful mindset. It's hard to break out of that particular mindset. And uh, and Nehemiah now is out. He's writing uh, from this place of authority. He's going through all uh, the Euphrates, trans-Euphrates, and all these different areas to go back to the place where it needs to be rebuilt again. And um, and this is in uh, Nehemiah uh, chapter 2, verse 11. You kind of follow us if you want to, but... He went, he went and he stayed there for three days and set out during the night with a few others. And he had, uh, he didn't tell anybody. They didn't tell anybody what God had put on his heart about Jerusalem. You can tell people some things, but there's something God puts on your heart. And understand if God has called someone and you know that God's called someone or some people to lead, I mean, they're not telling you everything. They're just, they're just be confident. If you know, this is the one God is called to lead, understand things are going to unfold. Things are going to happen because God has, has imparted something into that woman or that man's heart, or that team's heart. That's going to unfold over a period of time. If God would have unfolded all those plans to Moses before he went, would he even went? Right. You know what right. I'm saying? It's that relationship. And so he hadn't shared with anybody, and there was only there was there was no other horses or mounts, if you would, other than the ones that he was riding on. So you're looking at, I mean, it was a small crew. He was spying out the land, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? He's looking around. This is very important. And he says, by night, he went through the valley gates towards the jackal and the different gates, and he's riding in. And imagine his horse, and you're going through, you know, the, the folks that are down in uh, the Gulf Coast region. Imagine going through the forts down there, like Fort Pickens and Fort Barrancas and all these different forts are up there, uh, Fort Sumter in the, the east. and But you're taking your horse and you're kind of riding through there looking at the damage and things that have done. Well, obviously what the forts that he was going through, it was, uh, if you've been to Jerusalem, you can see the walls there. I mean, there's mm-hmm. walls there and there's gates. It's, it's empowering to, yeah. to think about all that. Humbling. Yes, it really is. And uh, so, he's, so he's evaluating everything that's in his heart. He's already... And this is so important. You need to, you know, be open to what God's going to do and how he's going to do it. And the thing is, it's, you know, I mean, Rick Jordan was talking about this and he struggled with it in his vision uh, that God had given him about the torch and the sword. And he kept on looking for the leader. He kept on looking for the leader. And that's what, you know, for years, you know, I've done that and I've heard others do it as well. But the truth is that, you know, you may be called to lead and you just got to lead. If God's called you to lead. He's told you to lead. And if somebody rejects your leadership, understand they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting what God's established. But if nobody leads, understand if nobody leads, you know, it's going to be chaos, confusion, captivity, and bondage. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to be set free. Right. You know, a lot of people, there's a lot of people who want to lead, but don't worry about that. That won't last long. But there's people that are called to lead and, and there's something inside of them that God has, has given them more than likely this heart of Nehemiah, that they abide with God, they listen to him, and even if they make mistakes, God's going to correct them and, and lead them in the right direction. But right now, this is what um, Chuck Pierce gave a prophetic word over our nation. He said that that, that the leadership in the nation and the world is, is locked down. It's just stuck. And the reason why it's stuck is because the leadership in the church is stuck. And when the leadership in the church becomes unstuck then the world leadership's going to break loose. Hmm. Which means as God's wanting to do something, Nehemiah, he's wanting, he's not, if, 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 if in fact, think about this, if in fact, you know, what was presently being done was doing what God wanted, look around, get on your horse, get on your mount, ride around and look. Do you really think this is what God wants? Do you think he wants these gates broken down? Do you think he wants the authority, the gates, the authority of the church just to be powerless? There's no protection do you really think he wants these, these these itching ear doctrines preached as people stay deeper and deeper in darkness and are, are servants of Lucifer instead of followers of God? Do you think that's what he really wants? Get on your horse, ride around, look. Uh, at some point, you got to say, you know what? I'm going to lead. I'm going to lead. And if God's called you to lead, you know, and, and have you know, be rightly related and connected, and that brings health to you. But lead, you know, lead. Because uh, God's people, that's just what God does. Mm. You know, God, that's been the pattern of God. 
you know, and a, t- a leadership team is really cool to be a part of that. But the, quite often, you, there's there's not people willing to be a part of a team. Uh, but you got to lead. You got to be able to lead. And so then he moved on towards the fountain gate. Nehemiah did. He went by the pools and he's just checking everything out. And for three days, he, st- he stayed there. In verse 15, he says, then finally, okay, now here it comes. Finally, I turned back to re-enter through the valley gate. And the officials did not even know that what I had going on or what was happening with them or anything like that. And he began to say to the Jews, he'd been say, he, he said to the Christians, he said to God's people, uh, he said to the Jews, well, he said nothing to the Jews, the priests, the officials, and then he came back and he said, listen, we need to rebuild this thing. He said, you see the trouble that we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. It hates its gates. I mean, its gates have been uh, burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the church in America. Mm. Think about mm. it. Come, let us get back our authority, the gates in America. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. Right now, the church is in disgrace, but we don't have no walls. I mean, of course you're in disgrace. You ain't got no clothes. Come on, mm-hmm. emperor. I mean, you're, of course you're in disgrace, but you get some walls up. You get some authority. It's amazing. The disgrace begins to go. And he says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me. And what the king had said to me. In other words, his encounter with with established authority validated that God was with him. Mm. His encounter with God with God is with, with all authority is established by God. So his encounter with horizontal authority proved that he had vertical authority to be able to do what he was doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's powerful. How many times people try to attempt to do things in their own strength and God has invalidated, God hasn't spoken. Yeah. But, you know, great strength and authority and clarity comes when you know this is what God said. Right. And this is what we're going to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, and so he gives his testimony. Well, this is what happened. You know, I went before the the government and this is what I said and this is what happened here and this is what's going on. And so you validate, hey, God's working with that man or that woman and the, the hand of God is on that man or woman to be able to do whatever needs to be done. And what, I mean, you think about it. When Saul got into his place of leadership, he was about self-preservation. He was terrified when he got there. He was terrified the whole time he was there. And God regretted the day that he ever let him be there. But God did let him be there. When David got there, people came and got him to be there. Mm. He had no problem serving the one in authority. And he finally said when he did get there and they came and got him, he said, I know why I'm here. And that's Nehemiah. People with Nehemiah's heart, they understand why they're there. He said, I'm here to protect God's people. He knew that the walls and the gates had to go up to be able to protect God's people. And this are the people we're talking about. They know why they're there, not to be able to promote themselves, their agendas, their kingdoms, or whatever. You know, they're just there to be able to take care of God's people. They, they People matter to them, and uh, they matter to God, and they matter to, to, to these these men and women. And so then, then he says, we should, be, we should be troubled about this. We should be troubled about this whole condition. And the thing about it, are you even troubled? And understand, it started first with Nehemiah being troubled. Nehemiah crying out. Nehemiah being broken, Nehemiah getting perspective, but you'll notice on this journey, and we have this conversation, he's going to lead all these folks into rebuilding and to taking responsibility and to getting the perspective right. And eventually everybody involved in repentance, mm. but it begins with one man's repentance. It begins mm. with one man's willingness to take the leadership and say, okay, God, the King asked me what I want. I guess we're going to go back and we're going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild. And so then he says, he says, let's start building. Let's just start building. You know, I told you the journey, told you what happened. We see the problem. The king said, I can do it. Here's my letters. I got all the wood we, we need. I got all the authority that I need. Uh, don't pay attention to Sam Ballot and the Sam mm-hmm. Ballot spirit. We're going to do this thing. So he replied to him. He said, listen, let's, you know, they replied to him. Once he shared all this, they replied to him, let's us start building. So they began to be able to do the work. Understand this, that if you don't understand Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3, you couldn't even answer any questions that the king would have asked you, and the people couldn't even run with rebuilding Jerusalem. He says you have to be able to write down the vision, make it plain so other people, a hero, could run with it so that they'll join you in it. He was able to so well articulate and so firmly lead and so listen to God in the context of this. Once he finished delivering the vision, this is what the people said. They said, let us then do this vision. Let us do what God said we need to do. 
let us start rebuilding the church in America. Let us start. Let it, I got it. Let's do it. Let's get busy. And understand prior to that, they haven't even gotten busy yet. But they bought in. They said, this is it. This is of God. We got the authority. This is right. This is pleasing to the Lord. Let us start rebuilding. And we're going to find out what happens next. Because now you're getting in. You're buying in. You're going to do what God said to do. But understand, with it comes persecution. But hold fast because these, these walls will be built if we do what God says. And these gates will go up in America once again. Hello. We are intently focused on a soak, if you would, in the word of God. Hmm. Hearing God in the heart of Nehemiah. And there is a lot of things going on right now. But listen. This is the epicenter of where we need to be right now. And we need to get this inside of us. Dear God, give us the heart of Nehemiah. Help us to understand the sum total of repentance. And if you haven't been following us, you can catch the uh, previous segments on all the different ways to hear us. You can find out at VFNTV.com. And, um, uh, but you don't, you want to do it. Yeah. You want to be able to hear it because I'm telling this, this is just change. This is just rock your world and give you hope. It'll give you great hope because maybe that, you know, God will give you a heart, the heart of Nehemiah. And maybe he has, and you're trying to figure out, you know, what do I do with this? And, uh, and if, if sometimes you could just think you're losing it, if you're, cause Nehemiah was the only one that had a heart like that at the time. Mm-hmm. And, but yet God was going to help a lot of people out because he began to do a work in Nehemiah's life. And mm-hmm. so we're talking about that. And of course, here we are, you know, we talked about the clarity of vision last time. He was able to communicate the vision, the direction the confirmation of his a vertical authority from God was verified by the horizontal authority from the king. And, uh, he, you know, Nehemiah is going in to rebuild, rebuild Jerusalem. And we talked, I mean, think about this. We're going in as all these folks who are hearing from God in America, and we're going to rebuild the church. The gates that are burned down, the authority is going to come back again in the name of Jesus. Mm. We're going to have authority to drive out demons and the, and to, to, to do the things that God's called us to do. And we're seeing it. We're seeing, you know, prophecy and words of knowledge and dreams. And God is speaking so much. You just got to figure, okay, I don't want to lose anything. Oh my goodness. What are we, we going to talk about? And, uh, and I really believe this is what the Lord is saying uh, of, of the crescendo of some of the things that he's saying right now. We've got to get the heart of Jeremiah, yeah. heart of Nehemiah in regards to how to respond to this broken down wall, burnt gate authority uh, scattered all over the place, uh, condition of the church right now in America. And, and then we got to heal her and the church is, is not a building, but, but as people, you know, we're living stones built together, holy priesthood. God lives inside of us and he's the ones putting us together like burnt stones. So when you're seeing you might understand, see Jesus in this and how he's speaking to us. Was that you and I that was in the Northern parts of Israel? And mm-hmm. the guy has the vision, and he, he literally saw, sees angels picking up uh, stones that have people's faces on them and putting them in the walls. Mm-hmm. Something I like remember that. These are living, these living stones, and the, and the Lord was just, and that's what we are. We're just living stones. God's building a holy tabernacle for himself and all of us to come together. So you're seeing this. So when the people is right, the dwelling will be right. So it doesn't matter what, what you're meeting in. It matters what's, who's meeting in you. Mm-hmm. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so that's what we're talking, about. we're talking about. We're talking about rebuilding people. And so here he is. He's communicated the vision to everybody. You know, we're in uh, uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse uh, 19 now. And so everybody's like, yes, this is great. This is wonderful. This is, I mean, man, the king gave you authority. He gave you an unlimited checkbook in the forest and all the materials that we need. He's put all this out here for us and, and, and he's protecting us from all these, these evil folks out here. Hey, he supports this is great. This is wonderful. And so, so let's just do this thing. And the next thing that's talked about is Sam Ballot. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't yet gotten and listened to, you can get it at VFNTV.com is um, rebuilding the walls, a spirit of Nehemiah versus a spirit of sand bottle. You got to, you need to get it. Cause you have to understand it. You have to, you're going to have to deal properly with this ridicule, the ridicule that comes from those that are held captive. That's what, that's what Satan does. Satan just uses ridicule, religious ridicule, any ridicule at all, anything that gets you to stop. We'll be right back. Don't miss your chance to get this free book. I will fight 10 strategies for your success. Why share a prophetic encounter God gave me about a coming wealth transfer. And this whole genesis of this book and these strategies is to position you for a coming wealth transfer. It's 10 strategies for success. Dealing with your belief, your actions, commitments, giving you plans, giving you strategies. There's so many things I can't even talk about. 
but it's yours for free. Go to VFNKB.com and get your free copy now. Welcome back to VFN TV with your host, Craig Lancaster. And so all of a sudden, here they are. Everything's going great. You're thinking, this is wonderful. Communicated the vision well. Everybody said, let's just do this thing. We're going to do it and prepare yourself because the hordes of hell, the ones that are held captive by by Satan to do his will, they're not going to just, he's just not going to let them sit back and not do anything because mm-hmm. you're disturbing their domain. Mm-hmm. You're disturbing their, their realm of, of dark influence. I mean, because when you bring light in a uh, darkness runs, I mean, you're changing things. And when you bring light in those who said they were light, find out that they're dark because of the fact as the light came in and just says, Hey, that was a lie you've been, cause this is the truth, you know, mm-hmm. type of thing. And so it says in verse 19, all of a sudden, here they're going, they're starting to build me. You can see them all pumped up, getting the building, the materials, the lumber's coming in. They're ordering the stuff from whatever, and it's all coming in. They're pumped. I mean, I can see it. I can see it. And then all of a sudden it says, when Sam Ballot and these other officials at Geshem and the Arabs heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. They mocked mm. and they ridiculed us. I mean, think about that. I mean, that is Alinsky Tactics 101. This is Lucifer Tactics 101. It always happens. Mm -hmm. If you can't survive ridicule, if you cannot survive, even the ones that you see, this is what she said. Jesus said, even members of your own household can be at odds with you. You can have ridicule coming from, David had ridicule coming from his own wife. When he was just trying to to bring the glory back into Israel, and he, and he went through this great tragic loss, and he's doing it in the way that he learned to do it now because he got in the Bible like Nehemiah and found out what needs to be done. His wife ridiculed him. Mm-hmm. It didn't bother him. It didn't bother him at all. And you got to be able to understand that in your neighbors and your your fellow you know ministers up the street or or some political official or whatever, I mean, just that's just typical because ridicule. But I mean, why would anybody that says they're of God when you're doing God's work, if they were of God, why would they ridicule you? Yeah. Think about it. Why would they ridicule lest they were held captive by Lucifer to make sure that no positive forward advancing movement was ever made in the kingdom of light? Mm. I like what Charles Simpson says. He says, listen, even if a dog shows up preaching Jesus, throw him a bone. <laughs> you know, you're just not against the gospel. You're just not against, you know, you're just, I remember when uh, Donna was out, um, uh, uh, doing the garage sales or something like that. And she was with a, um, a couple and she texted me a message and I was studying. She said that they're going to go plant a church in California. I mean, my heart was like, Oh my sister. Oh my goodness. And they were like selling something, some sort of exercise device or something. I'm like, get it, get it. I don't care what it is. Get it. <laughs> and, uh, um, then we find out a little bit more and, uh, and whatever, I'm just like, don't leave there without giving them something. Yeah, mm. that's how we are as Christians. That you're going to do something for God. <laughs> that's, that's how we're right. supposed to be. There's no kingdom but God's kingdom. Amen. There's no threat if you're in God's kingdom and you're seeing people advance His kingdom. You're happy about it. We are on the same, same team. <laughs> <We're all> the same. <laughs> Come on. I'll, I'll never forget. I was like, I was like. Give us, oh my goodness! In today's culture, what's going on? Somebody's gonna go plan church in California. Go. Don't give them, don't give them Rick Joyner's prophecy. Let them go. <laughs> yeah. Let them go. You know? And uh, I remember I was in Texas, and I was going. Uh, we met some people there that were preparing for the the mission field, and they were going to set up a mission right by the prisons in Mexico mm-hmm. to minister to the families of the prisoners. And I just wept and wept and wept, but I'm just so grateful for these. Brothers and sisters, they're going to go. I mean, who would ever thunk of, yeah, you're right. Oh, my goodness. Like, give them something. Give them something. <laughs> and understand, if somebody doesn't feel that way towards you with a Nehemiah's heart, understand that's a spirit of Sambalat. Mm. You know, Lucifer's got them captive, whether they like it or not, even though they use the name Jesus. You know, that it's if they're beating you for going forward in the kingdom of God and preaching Jesus, then they're, they're fearful that they're going to lose their kingdom. They're going to lose what they've got mm. versus it's like, oh. Uh, if it's not God, just let it go anyway. Hello. Let Hello. it go. It's heavy. It'll cause you to sink and you'll drown and stuff. Well, it'll, and it, it'll burn up later. It'll burn up. <laughs> that's right. Hey, wooden stubble, that's bro. It. Hey, wooden no, stubble. Right. And so they begin to ridicule and mock. And then this is what they say. It says, what is this you're doing? 
It's like, mm. where did you come from? Did, did that? Were you? At, did somebody text you what happened to? Them? <laughs> like, I ain't even posting nothing on Facebook. How in the world yeah, is this getting yeah. out right here? What you know? What what is this you're doing? They ask. He says, "Are you rebelling against the king?" And the first thing they Ooh. say, they start talking about. And let me tell you something. If you didn't do things right with your boss, if you didn't do things right with authority, if you rebelled and you you know you weren't didn't have the heart of Nehemiah, that's going to come back and bite you. Because mm-hmm. the first, this is what happens: that those who are held captive by darkness use horizontal authority to destroy you. Man, that is good. It's true. Yeah, I mean, it was it was the authorities the church would use the God not church, but the, well has, mm-hmm. but uh, it was the Jews that were using the 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 Pharisees and Sadducees were using the horizontal authority to do their dirty work. Wow. And acting like it wasn't them. Mm-hmm. But understand, you know, hey, it just just understand this. God's established it, so you want to honor it, and you want to do what's right before it, and, and that will be your validation. That will be your validation for what you're doing. I know that, you know, when we were walking out the Malachi mandate and, and prophesying for, I don't know, 10 years maybe, and, uh, you know, Malachi 4, 5, and 6, that... It was amazing. The governor and uh, the president, oh, yeah. the um, uh, military, the um, the sheriff, mm-hmm. the county commissioner, the uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, but weren't they the city yeah. council, yep. uh, government, business CEOs, uh, pastors, leaders? Uh, this is what Ken Summerall, a spiritual father to me, is with the Lord right now. Said he said never seen such unity ever in the history of his whole ministry. Mm. He's in his seventies at that time. And, um, but the authority was there. They were saying, this is good. As a matter of fact, the commissioner said, this is good. This, this is, is of good. God. Mm-hmm. Uh, the governor changed his speeches to end with Malachi. Mm. And he says that God is turning the, the father's turn, God's turning the hearts of the fathers, to the sons and the sons to the fathers. And he invited me to his mansion, yeah. you know, and, and understand that this is, there's, there's Nehemiah's all over in your city in your nation in your state, wherever you are. And you got to fight, you know, maybe you are that person. But you're going to have to rise up and realize ridicule is going to come. And if you did not react right, if you did not function in the context of humility before God, even if you had to be an Elijah Ahab situation where you had to speak truth to someone who only wanted pretty words, you know, God's going to honor that. He'll honor that situation that's going on. And that will be your, your, um, your pass, if you would, or your letter from God and from government that says, you know, this is, this is going to work. This mm-hmm. is going to happen. And this is this is his answer, and this is you can answer this. And we're going to go to a break, but you can answer this way too if you if you follow this the same path. Because remember, he said, because of the gracious hand of the Lord was on me, the king granted me all I requested. He never he acknowledged the horizontal authority, but he realized the true authority came from God. The mm-hmm. access to everything that happened came from God, and that should put the fear of God in any authority that's trying to buck up against what God is actually doing in the context of that. And even in the fact that Pontius Pilate, his wife, came to him and said, "Listen, I was tormented in my sleep all last night." But God wanted to accomplish what he was going to do right there. So this is what Nehemiah answers back to the uh, ridicule, mockers, and all the, the, the spirit of Sambalic crew, the Hornites, or horse for short. They said, um, they said that, he said, listen, the God of heaven will give us success. I mean, think about it. Well, that's, it's like they, under, they already know they're coming out of darkness. Right. They know they're speaking from darkness, and you look them square in the eye. And let me tell you something, Nehemiah. You look them square. If this has been your journey, and you have walked this out, and this is not something you got in your head, this is something you have the scars in your life. You look them square in the eye, and you tell them, right in their eyes, that the God of heaven will give us success. Think about that. Is that mm-hmm. powerful? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because like th- they're fighting against God. They're not fighting. This is what God wants. And when it's and, and think about this. We, his servants, will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in the church. Wow. No, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historical rights to this land, Jerusalem. Think about it. Even today, listen, we're going to do this thing because the gracious of the hand of the Lord is upon us. God, Ooh. give us the heart of Nehemiah. Help us to understand the perspective here of what you're saying. And at this point, understand that they, they're beginning to build. All of a sudden the ridicule began to happen. And, uh, I want to talk a little bit about ridicule, ridicule. I think about the vision that God gave Rick Joyner. He writes about it. The vision, he writes it out in the book called the torch of the sword. 
this is a vision he's writing out and it's so authentic. I mean, it mm-hmm. is the real deal. Mm-hmm. And he's looking at this 12 year old girl in the vision and God's showing this 12 year old girl. And, um, he couldn't believe that you have all these armies of this horde of hell coming against this little girl. And she has this tenacity. She's just, I mean, obviously got a heart of Nehemiah, the, the heart of the Lord to be able to say, you know what, you know, we're going to do this thing. And there's only mm-hmm. like one little small stream of water. That's all this stuff, just a little stream of water. And that's all that was left here in Jerusalem when they're rebuilding the walls, a few bricks, burnt stones, broken down, burnt gates. And you say, well, you know, what can God do with these, these loaves and these, this fish and these loaves? I mean, it doesn't matter. There's something. There's a very small stream there, and, and it's fresh water. It was the, you think about it, and it represents, you know, the, the water of God's word, the, the presence of God and uh, the, um, the word of God, drinking the substance of God. And the more you drink from this river, the better you feel, the clarity you got and all that. And so Rick just shows up, of course, how visions happen, and he's looking at this little 12-year-old girl, and he's thinking, Where's your friends? Right. You know, mm-hmm. Nehemiah, are you going to do this alone? You know, where's your friends? You know, how are you going to do this? And he goes, we're gonna, she says, you know, we're going we're we're to defend this stream. We're going to defend this stream. And, uh, and it's like a little small little stream. And he's looking up and he sees, you know, long story short, there's more to it. He just sees they're surrounded by this huge hordes of hell. Imagine these horses filled with, you know, demonic folks held captive and screaming and hollering, basically coming down and to destroy you, to take mm-hmm. over this little bit of piece of what do you do when rebuilding the walls? I was like, understand Satan wants nothing to do with God other than to criticize ridicule. He does not want you to preach the gospel. He does not want the truth of God's word to go out. Understand he will, he will come against the smallest little, um, uh, um, movement that's going on. And so here she is, she's, and he's going, listen, you need help. We're not going to be able to defend this alone. And uh, she said, uh, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fight. I'm not, I'm not going to give up. I says, she says, the reason why we lost our previous battles were, was because, one, uh, they didn't abide. Mm. <laughs> and we always talk to you about abiding. This is something you cannot do without Jesus. By the, matter of fact, you can't do anything without him. Mm-mm. Go to iabide.org and take on the suggestion of this little 12-year-old girl and begin to abide with God. Go to iabide.org. We have a simple plan for you to be able to do that. Request your free plan today. But then she says, you know, but also, you know, we had too many people with us. We had too many people with us. And, of course, I love the way that Rick thinks because Rick uh, Joyner thinks because he's very melancholy and logical, so he, he brings all those arguments up. And he says, yeah, but we need people. This is a big, this is a big horde coming against us and to be able to win. And she says, no, the last time we had way too many people because um, kind of paraphrasing here, we thought the number of people was better than agreement. Mm. Mm. And so they had, and so they were defeating themselves. Yeah. And that's what the church does. You just like grab any Tom, Dick and Harry off the street and just say, Hey, let's just do this thing. And it's like, you just created a whole mm. uh, horde of hell inside the very thing that Paul warned day and night about. He says, I warned mm-hmm. you with tears, never stopped warning you, I think for like three years, that wolves will come in amongst you, even from your own number. And today's church is like, hey, bring the wolves in. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's never going to work out if you bring darkness into light in the context of that, because you're going to defeat, you're going to have to fight against the hordes of hell to defend the water. And then finally, you know, another thing that she says is that, and another thing too, is that we try too hard to, to convince people to stay. You know, we, we like you know, overly encourage them and we should just let them go yeah. because they weren't going to fight. They're mm-hmm. not going to fight. And it, they became more of a hindrance to be able to focus against the true enemy because they weren't the enemy. They became a hindrance to focusing against the true enemy. And so we got to find out who's in agreement with God. Who's in agreement with this vision. I mean, Jesus took 12 and one of those wasn't in agreement, right? That's right. And, he, and he, I mean, we're telling time of this. And so in the context of that, this almost, she, she discovered that. And then finally, he says, well, well, where's our help then going to come from? And he says, well, it's going to be from the hordes of hell. I mean, these guys who are attacking you today will be serving God tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Go win them to God. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. This is exciting. So having the right perspective of those who are held captive by Satan to be able to do his will, who are ridiculing you today, understand that they'll be praising God tomorrow with that same lips when they're set free from this captivity. But she talked about her mother, you know, she said this, the young girl said, yeah, it was because Rick said, what are you doing here by yourself? And you're 12. And he said, well, my mother was going with me. We were starting to get here to this watering hole, this fresh watering hole, a non-muddied watering hole. And um, 
we're, we picked the weakest place to be able to walk through the hordes of hell, and the weakest place was ridicule. You know, she says, I knew that they could say thing to us, things to us, but they wouldn't. You know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Mm-hmm. She knew, even though it was going to be tough, that she can go through that. And she said, was we were going through that, that my mother could not handle it. Mm-hmm. She could not handle that. She so desperately needed the approval of men. Mm. She so desperately needed to, 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 to feel that she was okay in other men's eyes. When they started ridiculing her, that helped her, that caused her to begin to think, like, I want to, this one who's ridiculing me, I want to change what they think about me. I want to live my life in the reflection of their eyes. And it cost her. She ended up held captive. And he says, not only that, when she was held captive, then all of a sudden she took on the same spirit and then her mother began to ridicule her. Mm. And it's so cool because the perspective, this is God vision. Cause the girl says before they went to go attack the hordes of hell, the first person she prayed for that was for her mother and all of her family that's held captive by wow. Satan to do his will so they could be saved and set free. So she, she was fighting for folks, not against folks mm-hmm. and wanting to convert the ones who were attacking her. And it was amazing. You got to get this. If you haven't got the torch yeah. and the sword, you need to get it because yeah. we're, we're in it at this moment. It is happening as we speak and we need, we're looking, this is what's happening. There's mighty men and mighty women out there that God has called you. I mean, you're gifted, you're anointed, but your character sucks. I mean, you need somebody that can help you grow you up and teach you in the area of how to be able to function in the body of Christ. So you could be like this little girl and, and have that tenacity because your gifting can take you places that your character can't keep you. Yeah. And it's nobody saying that you're not gifted. It's nobody saying that you're not anointed and nobody wanting to put you out. Somebody's wanting to lift you up and train you up to be able to launch you out because there's mighty ones coming right now that God's going to want to train up that I believe and Rick Joyner believes and others believe that's going to bring in the end time move of God. No doubt. And there's going to be such an anointing because you're willing to be trained, because you're willing to be a part of this army of God, the spiritual army of God to go forth and to do battle on behalf of the king that um, and do great exploits for God and have the tenacity of this young little girl that I was just talking about that um, you're, you're willing to get rightly related that you're, God's going to use you. He's going to use you powerfully. And uh, you're no longer going to be like Baal anymore, prophesying off in the corner somewhere and people giving you quarters and change because everybody, everybody loves a good word. Mm. You know, ask Ahab. Mm-hmm. And so uh, in that, it's like, my goodness, he talks about these mighty ones. And so um, I know that the VFN Dream Center, that's our total goal. We're, we're looking, locating and relating to the mighty ones and, uh, and supporting the, the church at large and, and whatever we can do with, uh, you know, God's folks and helping them out. You can find out more at the VFN Dream Center dot com. But here he is. You know, so all that ridicule is happening. I want to encourage you as we're coming to the end of this particular conversation. We're going to continue it on and how to deal with the spirit of Sam about it and to maintain the spirit of Christ of um, of Nehemiah, the heart of Nehemiah. Here is um, understand that ridicule is going to come. It's going to crank up. That's the whole point. If you've listened to and you can listen, you can listen to it. You can go to VFNTV.com dot com and find it even in the store about uh, organizer of the organizers of the night versus organizers of the day, children of the light. Understand that, you know, Lucifer's captives are going to ridicule you, but you got to look past that and realize God loves that man. God loves that woman. You got to still maintain a compassion for them. If not, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt badly and you're going to say things you regret and divide yourself from the very ones that you were called to be able to save. Listen, she's the church. As Lecrae says, she's the church, so you got to love her. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you got to love her. Make sure you catch us on our next program as we continue to talk about the heart of Nehemiah. Be sure to watch part three and continue to learn the secrets for rebuilding the walls of your life, your family, and the church in part three of the heart of Nehemiah. Be sure to subscribe and press alert to get new notifications of new success secrets made available on VFN TV. You know, a lot of people want to abide with the Lord, but they just don't have a plan to do it. You can request that plan today at iabide.org. I'm your host, Greg Lancaster, and we're so glad that you've joined us. Don't forget you can join us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download our app and sign up for our newsletter, The Torch, at vfnkb.com. I've enjoyed our time together. God bless.